Now, keeping in mind that does not include the summer <coughs> residents. So roughly, if you double that, you're coming out to roughly 37,000 residents at a particular time in the town. Going back again for the leadership, you need to have a program in place. You need to have a leader in place. When you're having 37,000 people in a town, you need to have guidance. You need to have somebody that's embedded in the community, somebody who's part of the community fabric, working with the merchants, working with the residents, working with the different beach associations, working with the visitors to ensure that everybody is getting the services that we're paying for. And that doesn't happen today. There have been, I, I think, uh, maybe three different resident troopers overseeing the town of East Lyme in the last five or eight years. The continuity of management doesn't exist. Where is the philosophy? Where is the vision? Where is the strategy? Where is the planning? What is the program for the town of East Lyme? I haven't seen it, and I've asked the first selectman, and we don't have a program. You need a program to be successful. In uh, beginning July 1, the contract renews itself for the state of Connecticut. The cost for the resident trooper salary is approximately 212000 plus any overtime. In 2015-2016, the town budgeted approximately 155000 but was billed 173000 overtime, unregulated expense. The first luck can mention that next year, I believe the 2016-2017 cost is going to be 100% to the town of East Lyme. And we all know that the state of Connecticut budget right now is, is uh, there's no such thing as a budget with the state of Connecticut, obviously. Mm -hmm. And I can assume, based upon historical billing, that that 212 will somehow go south and the going north will be a higher number because they'll bill us for overtime, they'll bill us for his lunches and everything else, I can imagine. Again, it's not the individual trooper. It's the program or model by which they operate under, which is the concern. There was one other item that uh, we picked up, and I, again, uh, these two items, the trooper's salary and the, uh, the next item, the radio system, were not in scope for our committee to review, but we thought they were so egregious that we had to make it part of the presentation. I think it's good information. Uh, they're, they're implementing an enhanced radio system, the state police, of which the town of East Slime was going to receive a bill for about $150,000 with no input whatsoever. Here's the bill. In 30 days, please pay the bill. Unregulated costs. Being from the Board of Finance, I, I don't think we like to see these things, or as a resident or a taxpayer. We have no control over the state expenses pertaining to the program that we are currently working under. Regarding the, the 150000 I understand recently that it might be deferred for a year or so, but eventually that cost will be sent to the town. It might not be next year or two years or three years, but I can guarantee you we will see a bill at one point or another for an enhanced radio system. The town, by the way, does have a reliable radio system in place. We already have a radio system. We don't need a secondary radio system for the police to operate efficiently and effectively. We already have that infrastructure in place. I mentioned earlier about the uh, contract with the state police, excuse me, with the state of Connecticut. And I, I pulled this one section out of there because I thought, again, it, was, it, it should be known to the, uh, the Board of Selectmen and also the audience. The contract between the state of Connecticut and the town states, quote, 
the town shall hold harmless and indemnify the state of Connecticut and the Department of Emergency Services and Public Protection, its officers, agents, and employees from any liability. I'm not a lawyer, and I'm gonna, not going to pretend that I'm going to interpret this correctly, but basically my uh, layman understanding is if something happens in the town, the state can't be sued for anything. The town assumes all liability for any action which one of our officers gets involved in, and the liability falls within the town, not the state of Connecticut. We signed a contract that says we're going to hold them harmless. However, they did, as part of the contract, make the town include the state in a $1 million insurance binder, I guess you call it, in case for some reason that a smart plaintiff would sue the state or the officer involved in that particular uh, issue. So uh, in looking from the private sector, looking at this contract, uh, you know, uh, we would never uh, even come close to signing anything like this, but we're forced into it because we're part of the model or part of the program. So we have no choice in the matter. Going to uh, slide nine, which is the recommendation, In this first sentence is probably the crux of the whole problem that we see here with this issue. Strong and credible leadership is the foundation for any successful business. And we looked at this from a business model and a policing model. Even more importantly for a police department. A good leader will work with the town CEO, the board of selectmen, other town agencies, which is not happening today, as well as the residents and taxpayers of this town in developing and implementing a program that is supposed supported by all the stakeholders, not just a small group. The recommendation is terminate the contract with the state of Connecticut as quickly and efficiently as possible, but no later than June 30th, because that's when their contract expires for the new two-year contract. The caveat we have in here is the transition cannot take place without first appointing an interim or permanent director or chief to directly manage the East Line PD on behalf of the town. Uh, we can't, the committee can't emphasize enough the leadership issue here which creates all these other problems whether it be administrative, whether it be budgetary, or whether it be operational. That leader is responsible for all those aspects. Not following the recommendation of appointing an interim director or chief uh, will further exasperate the already tenuous situation. The committee's recommendation and conclusion is based on all the information and documents that have been reviewed and without reservation. This committee recommends that the town of East Line imp implement an immediate action plan which is different than what we did. To terminate the contract with the state of Connecticut and form its own independent police department. In summary and in closing, as a resident here for maybe 50 some years and a taxpayer and part of this committee and knowing what's going on, uh, I, I was totally disappointed, shocked, disappointed, whatever you want to call it, in the model that's currently being used today by our police officers. It was not designed for today's policing. 1950s was great. We had 3,000 people here and everybody knew everybody and Joe DeLora was the guy in the beat. <laughs> right, right. But today, the, the policing model has changed, and as we watch what's going on in the news every night, it's more philosophical, it's more strategic, it's more analytical, it's more technology-driven. You need a strong leader to implement that solution here in East Line. If we don't do it, I can guarantee you it might not be today or tomorrow, but something will happen here where everybody's going to be asking the questions, why didn't we do it when we knew we had a problem? So I'll end my comments and open to questions to the board. Thank you. That's how it will work. Yes. 
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gardner, and thank you to your committee. Uh, this, the, I am in debt to all the good work you've done, and uh, and done quickly. I, I only assembled this uh, this group 45 days ago. September 5th. <laughs> I do you know. So one months. month ago, and um, and <laughs> gave you 60 days, and it turned out you didn't need all of that time. Thank you very much for your work. I, I sincerely appreciate it. You you give a compelling. Um, discussion here, a very compelling argument for doing this. Are there questions for uh, Mr. Gardner or anyone uh, on his commission? I, I have a couple. Good. First of all, I wanted to thank you all for the work you put in, the time you have devoted and your obvious expertise. In your collective opinion, is there anything the town would be losing by leaving the state trooper program? Uh, I'll uh, ask, answer that with absolutely not. Quite the contrary. There'd be a tremendous amount of gain by going to an independent police department, such as grants, for an example, from the budgetary standpoint, from a leadership standpoint, from working with the board and all the other departments. So there'd be uh, the traction the other way would be extensive, more so than if pros and cons, the pros are very heavily. And I don't see a con, to be quite frank with you, of leaving because the state of Connecticut still has to provide those resources and services that you would have had, whether it be independent or under the resident, resident trooper program. You still have all those services by state statute. So nothing is lost by going independent. And I think the pros are quite heavily weighted. Okay. Were all of you... Uh, this is your consensus. Was there anything that was contentious among you, at differences of opinion, or did you just say, man, this is a slam dunk, we, we're all on board? I don't think anything becomes a slam dunk until you had a chance to investigate it. As I mentioned earlier, we took the report that was done by the chiefs of police, whoever that was, and we took it as reference material. But I think we wanted to make our own evaluation of what we saw, what we observed, and what we read. And I think the, the focus on is observations and looking at documentation. And I don't, I'll, I'll defer to anybody on the committee who has any other uh, difference on that or concern. But from my understanding, we were all in agreement after we observed some things and read some things and was able to get out and talk to the other stakeholders involved uh, with this process. Uh, uh, the only thing we, I, I think we, really were concerned why it didn't happen sooner. <laughs> Me too. Okay, and you're satisfied that any questions or concerns you might have had about undertaking this process were answered to your satisfaction? Absolutely. I mean, even though the scope is narrow, it was very blatant and very obvious. We didn't have to do much digging, believe me, to find the issues that we wanted to look for and find out what was the cause and effect, what is the root cause of the problem. And right at the top, it's the leadership issue. Okay. Thank you. Any comments from anybody independent of that? And that's okay if you do. Okay. Leadership? No. You, you sure picked a good spokesperson, let me tell you. Good comment. The money was right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, hold on. There Are there any other questions? Well, I have quite a few comments, but they are primarily based on the document that was provided, uh, I think, compiled by the Police Chiefs Association. That yeah. might come up in the next report from the uh, sergeants group. Okay. Uh, because your committee was not charged with looking at the financial impact. Correct. Correct. And making any comparisons for that. Okay. That was out, out of scope. And. Um, you talk about this one? Yes. Yeah. Okay. But in particular, on this, I'd. I uh, ask you to refer to page three of that, which would show a typical structure. Yep. So uh, the, as it shows here on the typical structure, the obviously the chief of police replaces the resident state trooper. Now, the executive officer, in, in your vision, this would necessitate as sort of a, a deputy or a lieutenant. I think, okay. the, yes, I, I think the committee, we discussed it briefly, and maybe, Joe, you want to answer that? Uh, he's more knowledgeable than that, but yes. Um, one of the things that we looked at uh, as far as the chain of command goes, 
it goes, it's kind of like a twofold. Uh, a chief, obviously, would be the, the optimum to run the department. As whether or not you have a deputy chief or you have a captain or a lieutenant. The issue that you might start out with here is we also looked at the uh, contract that the town has with the police department today. If you um, wanted to supervision in which that would be a recommendation to stay out of the union so that you have su supervision and can run your department in a, pro in a way it should be running, in a way the town would want it to be run, um, you would, so you would go above and stay above uh, the rank of lieutenant. Because in the contract itself, it says you, the lieutenant has to be in the union. Mm -hmm. So just, just be aware of that. If you decide to do that, you decide to do that. Mm -hmm. But you would be looking at, for a second, either a, a captain or a deputy chief. And with 21 people, you might not want to go to the deputy, but you could certainly do that. And then the person who's responsible for the um, record keeping and uh, securing the records, would that be an additional person? Mm -hmm. Or could that be, is that an isolated job or could that job be done by a regular police officer? Oh, no, no. You wouldn't want to do that in the first place. That's a full-time uh, position with the responsibility by statute, and that's regulated, and you can really get yourself into trouble if you're not right on, on reporting and having that and being accountable, then mm -hmm. you, because you're dealing with money, you're taking care of the people who come in, the insurance companies, that's a big, that's a big job. Okay, so that would be a separate issue. That's a separate issue, and you also have to, you're, you're in strict regulations as to how you're gonna store, where you're gonna store, and under what conditions. That's a really big thing. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so, we would be responsible for uh, really total, total management. Everything. Except for a major crime, in which case the state police would come in and assist. That's right. Yep. Anytime uh, he hit on it right real well. Uh, we would not lose anything that the state police gives out there today to any town. They will do the same with us without a contract. What would be the breaking point for determining a major Crime? That would be uh, up to the chief. So the chief would yep. be responsible for calling in the assistance of the if state whatever police. assistance he thinks he needs or the town fathers think that they need, he, they can call it in. Yes. Okay. And, and, of course, the state's attorney would be involved on it, too. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, I um, remember fondly many of the briefings given by uh, <laughs> Sergeant Vance. Paul, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes. And um, who, would, who would fulfill that, that position? I thought about that. I would say at this point that would probably be a decision that the first selectman would make. But he could do it himself. He could have someone speak for the town. Or he could have the chief do it. Mm -hmm. And a lot of cases, in, and when you deal with homicides or serious crimes, it's probably going to be the chief because he's the guy that knows what's going on and, and not anybody wants to stand in front of that microphone and talk about something they don't know what they're saying. And they don't want to be quoted saying the wrong things. So that's something that will come in time and we, you learn from that. But pretty much uh, you're going to want somebody that really knows about the case. To well, we're just trying to get a handle yep. on the number of additional personnel right. that might be required. Right. And... Um, then the section on um, the public, the public safety, the dispatchers, under this plan, they would be wrapped into as part of the police department. Yes. I, I, again, that's up to this group. But is that it's, the recommendation of your committee? Well, today they're all qualified. They, we, when we did our talks with the, with the sergeants and everything, they had absolutely no problems. They're well qualified, the dispatchers. They know the radio system. They set, tell us the radio system is good to go. That's a big savings. And with their training that they already have, I, don't, I really don't see a problem. So would they fall under the jurisdiction then of the chief of police? I think that, again, that's going to be your decision, yes. how you want to do that, because you're dealing with two different, you're dealing also that group, I believe, dispatches fire and ambulance too. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And the collect system. Maybe one training, one other. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. All right. Is it? The committee's recommendation that we proceed with the chief of police and the restructuring prior to taking on a 
building. So I'm sorry, say that again? Is it a committee's recommendation that we hire the chief of police and establish the structure prior to having a building? Well, and, yeah, it didn't, that didn't come up to us. The only thing that we would say, and we have talked about, is you need to, for economy, uh, for the liability, for the savings of money, if you're going to go, you should go. And, you know, your building is going to come down the road. I mean, that, that was specifically not part of our task because I, th I believe the first selectman uh, thinks that's a different, that's a bigger thing uh, to deal with or another item to deal with to get this to happen. But for the liability, for the command structure, which is the really important thing, he, he keyed on it that you've got 21, 22 good, very good people, but they've never been allowed to really go out and do the job that, that they're trained for and that they're capable of doing. And you need somebody, this town needs somebody, stop wasting the money and make the switch and get it done as soon as you can and then move forward with different things. Because there are going to be other things that you're going to need as you go along. It's not that simple, but there's a lot of things that we have to do to make this thing happen because we've gone for, we've never had a, a regular police department. It's always been under the resident trooper program. Uh, you examined, I think uh, you mentioned, uh, Mr. Gardner mentioned uh, that you did look at the A&O manual that was done for the town uh, by the officers themselves worked on it. Is that sufficient? Well, to the two of us, we actually did the first uh, okay. run on that and went through that a couple years back. And yeah, probably we'd have to take a look at it and, and, and update it to uh, a full time, change some wording in it, but it's good to go. Yeah. All right. I think that uh, that's uh, my questions for this evening, but we're going to have additional discussion on Absolutely. the Absolutely. We're, we're only halfway there. Okay. And Thank then, you very uh, much for your time. Play of other discussion. Mr. Salerno, you look like you have a question. A uh, few, few questions. Um, Mr. Gardner, you mentioned that you think uh, our the police policies that we have right now are outdated or based on the 50s and 60s. Do you have recommendations or you, do you think we should go to, if we become an independent force, become state accredited, do you think it's something or that's something that new policy would be dictated by the, the chief and the police commission? I think whether it be here or in place, health policies are always in need to be reviewed and updated on a continuous basis. Uh, to exclude them or not review them is wrong. I think the policy would be updated. However, as, as Joe mentioned, I think the, the most critical element of this whole process is the leadership getting a chief in so that person can establish uh, the chain of command and also what happens with the department in, in concert with the Board of Selectmen. There needs to be a vision. There's no vision here. There needs to be a strategy in place. There's no strategy. The leader, that's his or her job, is to come up there and develop this, develop a program in place and that say these policies need to be updated, this needs to be done, or whatever the case might be. But I think a good, strong leader is so critical to the success of this particular initiative that uh, I think you mentioned about the building first. You need to have a leader in there. You need to have a leader to input of what goes on from a budgetary standpoint, from an administrative standpoint, from an operational standpoint. Working together in a collaborative manner with the town not independently and going to the state and say, oh, no, we're not doing any of this, and there's grant money available. There's a lot of things that would happen once you transition from a, uh, the program to an independent police force. So I think there's many, many, as I said earlier, positive things that will happen once you move over to that. Uh, okay. Um, you mentioned the radio system that the state may be billing us. We may have to switch over again. If uh, is if we go to our own police, independent police force, is that something that we're not going to have to deal with in the future? That's correct. We have our own system. My understanding yeah. is okay. we have a reliable, as of one day I was spoken to the person in charge and we have a very reliable radio system. We don't have to uh, add any additional technology. So our radio system is sufficient. I know we're possibly putting up another antenna. Up That's correct. Upon, There's a tower I think going up, uh, I want to say Hostaway <coughs> Road. Yeah, it is. Yeah. 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 Uh, and I think that completes and that completes the that completes it. So our system yes. is sufficient. We would go down to one radio. Yeah. Um, the only question: Would you recommend? Would would your uh, committee recommend if we move forward with this uh, to overlap a chief with the resident state trooper? No. Okay. I, I would say no. Would it be uh, a complete Financially, handoff? No. And in philosophically, no. I don't think we need a state employee 
misguiding our leader who we've, yeah. we've hand-selected because of his credentials. Okay. Uh, I, I think that we want that person to establish their credibility by themselves with the town and saying, here's my action plan. This is what I want to do. Okay, so that makes sense. So it's a handoff. If, if we were to move forward with this, and let's say this past referendum, can we leave the resident state trooper program in the middle of the year? Would we get the, the money back that, uh, from its salary, or are we, we in a contract for the whole year? We have a 30-day out. We give notify the state of Connecticut. My understanding is yes. it's a 30-day notification Correct. that on uh, January 1, we no longer want your services. We're terminating the contract, contractual relationship. So that means we stop paying. Do we, yeah, do, yeah, we sure. don't pay up front, right? We pay as in arrears. As Correct. We so they arrears. would bill us as we use this service. Okay, so we would not be paying. For no, so if we switch not. over, it will. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And okay. if you do the math, there's quite a bit of savings if you look at the math involved here. Yep. Um, my only other question is, um, and, and maybe I don't know if you're the right folks to ask. Um, there's other revenues that can be can be right with them. I know speeding tickets still. Even speeding tickets would still go to the state. Is that correct? Yep. And we got a ten dollar. We get so much back. Okay, you, you may have the answer. Yeah. The, okay. So then I'll then Sergeant Masick's going to come up. Yeah. Just, so, okay. just so you know what the agenda is tonight. Sergeant so then Masick I'll will be up okay. next on the details. Then, uh, then that's all I have. Thank you guys for your service and for your quick turnaround. Uh, well, I'll, I'll, I have a, a couple of questions, sure. and maybe they'll be answered by Sergeant Masick. But I, um, one of the concerns I think is and you've addressed it somewhat, our access to the resources of the state police. Once we leave that um, resident trooper system, not only in a, ma you know, a major crime, we've got a murder, uh, uh, but step down from that, you have a, a nasty automobile accident, and you really need those resources of the state police to conduct uh, the uh, you know, reconstruction activities that a local department might not have. So are we still going to have... Um, that pipeline to the state police for those resources when we need it. I think, Joe, uh, correct me by state statute, yeah. they must provide those services upon request by the first selectman or by the chief of the department. So by state statute, they just can't say no. Uh, they have to make right. I, I, those I, resources I, available. Right. I, no, I saw that in the statute. Yeah. But I guess as more as a practical matter, do you, do you get yep. a little bit higher up in the file of requests when you have a resident Joe? state trooper or no. you're going to get service? Joe, I guess that's the question. How does it really work? Yeah. How it really works is if you call and ask the state's attorney, if you need help on a crime, ask the state's attorney, you're going to get the help right away. Yeah. The state does that. They, any towns that, that have gone over from resident trooper to a full-time, the state's there. If you need a dive team, you need dogs, Anything that you can think of that they have in their inventory, we still get by state statute. And they actually do come. Now, the, 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 one of the things that you might say is, well, sometimes it takes a little bit of time. Well, that's true. It depends on where the people are coming from. That's always been a thing. But even today, in any town that, uh, like if, even if Hartford called for help, you still might take a little bit of time before you get there, depending on where they're coming from. But that's the way the state is set up. Okay. And Yeah. And then I guess I, the other question I have, and um, uh, Selkman, uh, for Selkman Nickerson referred to it as uh, in his opening comments where um, you have a state trooper from Danbury that show, just happens to be passing through and takes control of the scene. Uh, right now with the resident state trooper program, they have that jurisdictional piece where they can step in. And, now, when you become your own, they don't do that. So and, and so you would you would have more independence from the state police Total. And, and would be more at, at the request. It's of the, yes, yeah. they come in as an invited guest at that time. Okay, that was my question. Yeah. thank you. All right, that's yeah. all I have. Any questions? Any others, folks? Again, I hope you stick around to the at least at the end of the meeting. And my, my guess is we'll need your services again at some point during this process. Very much appreciate it. Is there anything else you'd like to add, Tom, before I bring Yeah, I, I just Mesa want to close with comments that uh, I think the committee is in agreement consensus-wise that the, the most seriously serious issue facing the town of East Lyme is the leadership issue and the liability issue. And I think from a risk threat assessment standpoint uh, that you need to address those issues. And I think the leadership addresses the liability issue. Without this leadership issue and then the person coming up with a program which is adopted by the town, working with all the town agencies. I think the town is uh, 
is in trouble, to be quite frank, without having those elements in place. And I think the leadership or the, the person can be done more quickly than a building. So I wouldn't wait for the building. I'd go right for the leadership and resolve 90% of the problems. I would, that, that's my guess. Thank you, Tom. We have a plan on that, too, how we're going to get this done without a building initially. Yep. And, uh, and thank you for that. Thank you once again. Uh, as, I, as I discussed, Sergeant Masick's here for some details. And, and Sergeant Masick, as you're coming up, I can kind of give the, the history of the relationship. I, when, when speaking to the seven sergeants who really, I, first of all, I commend, I commend your group. Uh, each and every sergeant stepped up, and I, and I tasked them with doing the homework. I said, you, you guys want this? We gotta, we gotta do this together. And uh, they each went out and, 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 and spoke to towns and spoke to um, uh, all sorts of gathered information, all sorts of different ways to make sure we're, we're doing this uh, and we can do this successfully. I'll also say that um, you know we are a budget conscious town, aren't we? <laughs> you know, um, and you know the buck ends up stopping here right so so we we are are always mindful of what any change any purchase any significant ordinance like this will do to our bottom line um uh, mr gardner made a compelling argument about you know we need leadership and we're not getting our money's worth based on what we're putting in and then i i, I started with we have to be cost neutral here at least initially we have to be able to flip a switch and go, you know, we had a resident state trooper for $212,000 plus or minus. Can we hire a chief? Can we pay rent at Waterford for their jails for the next several years until we figure out what we're going to do about a, a police station? The administrative clerk that we may need, the extra half a dispatcher will need to cover a shift. Uh, those are the personnel. Can we do that relatively inside that bubble of 212,000. We're close to that. We think we are within that. We think um, we can get a quality chief for $100,000. 90 to 110, okay? Because we, we, don't, we haven't been out there yet shopping the market. We've done our research. Ledger's gets a little bit more than 100, but you know, we, we typically as a town pay a little less than everybody else anyway. Um, yes, we so have one and a half administrators. <laughs> I'm sorry. But isn't that the truth? <laughs> <laughs> 50 years as a teacher, Mrs. Hardy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, congratulations on that. Um, so um, we have one and a half administrative clerks now. We need two. Uh, we had one administrative clerk. We have another half coming on. It's in our budget starting on January 1st. Yes. We'll need two. We have four and a half dis full-time dispatchers. We need five. So we're already, we're half there, we're half here. And so we're, we've been piecing this together anyway. Uh, not slipping it by you, but we needed it. Frankly, we're a busy town. We don't have 3,000 people anymore. We have a force that is straight out at all times, but with a lack of true leadership and direction and focus. And, and, and thank you for that inspiring um, brief. Um, Sergeant Masix here, maybe to run down shortly and quickly, not, not into great detail. Maybe we do this at the public hearing if we get yes. that far. But, but you know, how, what, what this would look like. Right. Okay. So, good evening. Um, what I want to do first while I'm up here is just kind of, I've got a kind of a script thing just so I can kind of stay on point because <laughs> this can obviously, as we see, open a huge can of worms. We have a subcommittee that was tasked with gaining uh, information from us outside agencies and formulating their own unbiased opinion, um, which I think they've done a, a great job with. We've met with them several times. But uh, just to, as I was taking some notes, as I was hearing, uh, Mr. Cunningham, the, the CSP resources, uh, you mentioned accident reconstruction, you know, things that we would have. Uh, a few of us have always had in our mind, I've been, I'm coming up on my 15th year here, um, under this program, there are officers that have been here over 30 years <clears throat> under this exact program. The one thing I've always wanted to ask a lot of people in town, and especially when it comes to the political side, is not what would we lose or why, why, uh, why don't we stay with it, but why would we stay with the CSP? You tell me what the town gains. 
by staying with that program. And I think as this uh, committee has come to uh, an agreement, it's we're actually at a loss uh, financially, service-wise. Um, the you brought up a serious accident, the reconstruction issue. We do have accident reconstructionists. Training is one of the is one of the areas that obviously uh, we do have a training budget. It was cut a little bit this year, but we do have a, cre a training budget. Um, in the aspect of when I speak with us going with Waterford, uh, in talking to their police supervisors, their chief, uh, their lieutenants, what we would do is coordinate with them, with their accident reconstruction guys, and we would have basically a two-community reconstruction team, like the CARS unit that the state police currently has, that comes out and helps investigate fatals and things of that nature. So we would now take on that responsibility. If there is some asset, and this really goes back to the uh, contract between the town and the state police, uh, whatever asset we do not currently have as East Lyme officers uh, available to us during that shift, we would then rely upon the state police to provide those extra services uh, under that current program that we operate. Um, one of the things uh, that is definitely a pro <clears throat> is we will gain uh, major time because currently under this program, if I were to request a helicopter we have two dogs, but sometimes if they're not working or they're on vacation, they're just not available for us to even call them in uh, from home, we'll call one of their dogs. Instead of them calling next door to Waterford for a dog, they'll get a dog out of Litchfield County and wait that extra hour for that dog when I literally have one that is less than a quarter mile away. Um, so what occurs is as we have a chief, as we have a deputy or a captain or somebody, and we need one of these services, whether it be the helicopter or a dive team, something, 